1.4 1. Do you have a big family? Do you have a big family? 2. What don't you like about the place where you live? What don't you like about the place where you live? 3. What sports or games are you good at? What sports or games are you good at? 4. Do you think you have a healthy diet? Do you think you have a healthy diet? 5. What makes you feel happy? What makes you feel happy? 1.5 1. One. Do you have a big family? 2. What don't you like about the place where you live? 3. What sports or games are you good at? 4. Do you think you have a healthy diet? 5. What makes you feel happy? 1.6 1. 1. Do you have a big family? Yes, actually. I'm one of seven. I have five sisters and a brother. Wow! That's a huge family! 2. What don't you like about the place where you live? Well, for one thing, I don't like my neighbors very much. Why not? What's wrong with them? 3. What sports or games are you good at? Well, I'm not really very athletic, but I'm very good at chess. Me too. We could play a game one day. 4. Do you think you have a healthy diet? Yes, very. In fact, I'm a vegan, so I only eat fruit and vegetables and grains and no meat or fish. How interesting. How long have you been a vegan? 5. What makes you feel happy? Lots of things. Uh, like buying new shoes. Oh, really? I can't think of anything worse. 1.7 1. Wow, that's a huge family. 2. Why not? What's wrong with them? 3. Me too. We could play a game one day. 4. How interesting. How long have you been a vegan? 5. Oh, really? I can't think of anything worse. 1.8 1. 1. Demanding 2. Flustered 3. Bizarre 4. Think on your feet 5. Approach 6. Rather than 7. Crush 8. Recruitment agency 9. Job seekers 10. Flapping 1.9 1. 1. I was being interviewed for a job with an advertising agency and the interviewer kept checking information on my resume and then asking me about it. And he saw that I studied philosophy in college, and he said, Oh, I see that you studied philosophy in college. Do you still practice philosophy? So I said, Well, I still think a lot. Anyway, he obviously liked the answer because I got the job. 2. At my job interview to become an editor with a publishing company, there were three people asking questions, two managers and a woman from Human Resources. All the questions had been pretty normal. They were about my studies and experience. And then suddenly the woman from Human Resources asked me, What would make you kick a dog? I was totally flustered, but I managed to answer, 
I said. I'd only kick it if the dog had bad grammar and couldn't punctuate properly. I thought it was a clever answer, and in fact, I got the job. Three. When I was applying for a teaching job in Korea, they were doing the interviews by phone because I was in the US. And because of the time difference, they were all very early in the morning, which is not my best time. Anyway, the director of studies of this particular school asked me, how tall are you? And how much do you weigh? I answered his questions, but after the interview, when I thought about it, I decided that I didn't want to work in a school that would judge me by my height or my weight. So later, when they offered me the job, I turned it down. Four. I was being interviewed for a job, and the interviewer asked me, what animal would you like to be reincarnated as? So I said a cat, because it was the first thing I thought of, and because cats have a good life. Well, at least in the U.S. they do. And then the interviewer immediately looked a little embarrassed and said that he had been told to ask me that question to see how I would react, but that he thought it was a stupid question. In the end, I didn't get the job. So maybe the interviewer wasn't very fond of cats. Five. I went for a job interview at a lawyer's office. There were two of us waiting to be interviewed, me and a man about the same age as me. He was nice, so we were chatting before we went in, and we agreed to have a coffee afterward. Well, I went in first, and they asked me the usual kinds of questions about my previous job. They had all my personal information on my resume, and so they knew I was married, and suddenly they asked me, Are you planning to have children? I said, Not in the immediate future, but maybe one day. Afterward, when I was having coffee with the other candidate, I asked him if he'd been asked the same question, and he said no, even though he was married too. In fact, we both got offered jobs, but I still think that it was a very sexist question to ask. 1.10 Fatos began to look very carefully at the coffee grounds in Chris's cup and to tell him what she could see. I remember that the first thing she said was that she could see sacks of money. And this was very accurate because Chris had worked in Saudi Arabia for several years and had earned a lot of money there. She also said that she could see a blonde lady. Well, Carla, Chris's girlfriend at the time, was blonde, so that was spot on too. But then, Fato suddenly looked very serious, and she said, I can see somebody in your family who is sick, very sick, at this moment. I remember thinking, oh no, don't ruin a nice evening. But Chris is a very laid-back kind of person, and he didn't seem to be too worried by what she'd said. He just said, well, as far as I know, the people in my family are okay. Chris is an only child, and his mother lived with her sister. They were both in their 70s. Fato said one or two more things, and then we asked the waiter for the check and said our goodbyes. It was a slightly weird end to what had been a very enjoyable evening. I can remember feeling relieved that I had said no when Fatos asked me if she could read my coffee cup. Chris and I got a taxi back to our hotel. The next day, Chris had a free morning because it was my turn to do the teacher training session in the hotel. So he went out early to go sightseeing in Istanbul. Around 9 o'clock, I got a call on my cell phone. It was Chris's girlfriend, Carla, calling. She told me that she needed to talk to Chris immediately, but that he wasn't answering his cell phone. I could tell by her voice that she had some very bad news for him and I immediately thought of what Fatos had said the night before, and I felt a shiver run down my spine. I asked Carla what had happened, and she told me that Chris's aunt had died suddenly in the night. So, was it just a spooky coincidence? Or did Fatos really see what she said she saw in the coffee cup? I spoke to her before I left Istanbul, and I told her that Chris's aunt had died the night we had dinner. She wasn't at all surprised, and she just said, Yes, I saw in the cup that someone in his family was near death, but I didn't want to frighten him, so I just said that the person was very sick. All I can say is that 
I always used to be very skeptical about fortune telling, but now, well, I'm not so sure. 1.11 1. Well, Carla, Chris's girlfriend at the time, was blonde, so that was spot on too. 2. But Chris is a very laid-back kind of person, and he didn't seem to be too worried by what she'd said. 3. It was a slightly weird end to what had been a very enjoyable evening. 4. So, was it just a spooky coincidence? 5. I always used to be very skeptical about fortune-telling. 1.12 1. I heard a noise in the middle of the night. You did? What kind of noise? 2. You don't believe in ghosts, do you? No, I don't. 3. I don't believe you really saw a UFO. I did see one. It couldn't have been anything else. 4. I've never been to a fortune teller. Neither have I. I have. It was really interesting. 1.14 I dreamed that I saw a ghost last night. You did? So did I. How spooky. I don't believe in fortune telling. You don't? I do. 1.15 you don't like horror movies, do you? I do like them. It's just that sometimes they're too scary. 1.17 What's in your signature? Our signature is very much part of the way in which we present ourselves to the world, so it can definitely give us some clues about the kind of person we are and how we feel about ourselves. As you know, a person's signature usually consists of a first name and a last name, or an initial and a last name. Your first name represents your private self, how you are with your family, and your last name represents your public self, the way you are at work or school and in your social life. If you use only initials either for your first name or your last name in your signature, this means that you are more secretive and protective about either your private or public self. Now, look at the space between your name and last name. Are the two names very close together, or is there a reasonable space between them? The more space there is between your name and your last name, the more you wish to keep these two parts of your personality separate. 1.18 The size of your signature Now let's look at the size of your signature. If your first name is bigger and more prominent in your signature, this usually means that your private self is more important to you than your public self. If your last name is bigger and more prominent, this probably means that your public self is more important to you. If your whole signature is very big compared with the rest of your writing, this usually means that you are a self-confident person. Some people actually sign in capital letters, which suggests that they may be big-headed or even arrogant rather than just self-confident. On the other hand, people who sign their name with a very small signature tend to be insecure and have low self-esteem. 1.19 The legibility of your signature Another important factor is how legible your signature is. In other words, how easy it is to read. A legible signature tends to mean that you're a person with clear ideas and objectives. On the other hand, if your signature is difficult to read, this may imply that you're somebody who doesn't think very clearly and that you may be disorganized or indecisive. It can also mean that you're secretive. Generally speaking, the more illegible your signature is, 
the less assertive you probably are as a person. 1.20 The angle of your signature. Finally, I want to say something about the angle of your signature. That's to say, whether your signature is horizontal or goes up or goes down on the page. A rising signature, one that goes up, means that you are the kind of person who, when you're faced with problems, will work hard to overcome them. You're a determined person and probably optimistic and ambitious. A descending signature, that is, one that goes down, suggests that you're the kind of person who gets disheartened or depressed when you're faced with problems, maybe because you are not very self-confident. A horizontal signature, one that goes straight across the page, usually indicates a person who is well-balanced and emotionally stable and someone who is generally satisfied with the way their life is going. But it's worth bearing in mind that the angle of our signature may change at different times of our lives, depending on how we're feeling. 1.21 1. Some people actually sign in capital letters, which suggests that they may be big-headed or even arrogant. 2. A descending signature suggests that you are the kind of person who gets disheartened or depressed when you are faced with problems, maybe because you are not very self-confident. 3. A horizontal signature usually indicates a person who is well-balanced and emotionally stable. 1.22 Bad-tempered. Good-tempered. Open-minded. Narrow-minded. Absent-minded. Easy-going. Laid-back. Tight-fisted. Two-faced. Strong-willed. Self-centered. 1.23 Part 1 Preparing for a Job Interview My name is Jeff Neal. I'm a career coach. And I help people discover the right career for them and then actually go get that job. How important is the resume when you're applying for a job? The resume is really important because it represents you. It's often the first presentation of your skills and abilities to an employer before they actually have a chance to talk with you. What are some mistakes that people make with their resumes? So some of the biggest mistakes that, that I've seen that people make on their resume is they include everything, right? As an employer, I don't care what you did 20 years ago or 30 years ago. You may have been a star at something that you did 25 years ago, but as an employer, I'm thinking, this has no relevancy to me. You've changed over 25 years. The world has changed over 25 years. So people include far too much information in their resumes. My recommendation is that they only go back about 15 years. Are there any other mistakes? Another completely unforgivable mistake is grammatical errors, bad punctuation, and spelling errors. When I see a resume that has you know, more than one error, it's done, right? We live in a world where resumes are expected to be perfect. So word processing has spell check on it. There's just no reason to have something misspelled. How important is a candidate's social media presence? Yeah, in today's world, almost all hiring managers and HR staff will look for you online before they interview you. So your online profile can actually either help you get an interview or it can stop you from getting an interview. So for your social media, you wanna be really careful, particularly when you're looking for a job, you wanna be really careful about what pictures you're showing and what conversations you're posting is public information. You also wanna do a Google search on your own name. Assuming a candidate gets an interview, how do you help them to prepare for it? So the way I help candidates prepare for interviews is I, I have them take the job advertisement, right? They can get the job advertisement if it's posted online or a job description from the HR office. 
and to go through it and simply circle what are the skills and abilities that are required to do that kind of job. And to take an eight and a half sheet of paper and make three columns. And in the first column, list the key skills and abilities that are required to do that position. And then in the second column, list where they've used those skills and abilities in different roles in their career. And then in the third column, to actually create stories that demonstrate how they've used those skills in those different companies. 1.24, part two, on the day of the interview. What tips can you give a candidate for the day itself? For example, how should people dress for an interview? It's important to dress appropriately for an interview because if you're underdressed, for an interview, it shows a lack of respect, right? Companies and employers are going to look at that and say, this isn't, this person's not taking this interview seriously. So I encourage my clients to actually overdress a little bit for an interview. Now, how can you determine the best way to dress for an interview? You might actually get on a company's LinkedIn page and look at their LinkedIn photos because that'll give you a sense of that company style. Are they all dressed in suits and they're really formal? Are they more relaxed? Another way outside of a big city is that you can often stake out the front door, you know, a couple days ahead of time and see how employees are actually going into that office. How are they dressed? Obviously, you shouldn't be late, but how early should you get there? So you want to show up at an interview about five minutes early. If you get there earlier than that, just grab a cup of coffee in a nearby uh, restaurant or shop. And that when you walk into the interview, you don't want to have your headphones on. You want to make sure your cell phone is turned off. You don't want to have any interruptions. Do you have any other tips before the interview starts? As soon as you walk into the building for a job interview, you've already begun the interview. The way that you greet people, the way that you greet the receptionist at the front desk and security, if there is security, all those people are part of the interview process because if you don't handle it in the right way, they may tell the person that you're interviewing with how you approach them and your chances of getting the job can actually be eliminated. So it's important that you treat everyone that you meet in the building as part of the interview process. 1.25, part three, during the interview itself. Is it okay for a candidate to talk about money or salary during an interview? It is okay for a candidate to talk about money and salary during an interview, but the real question is, when should they talk about money and salary? And the answer is, late. One of the biggest mistakes that job candidates make is they focus too much on their own needs, right? So work-life balance is important, the number of hours I'm gonna work, the amount of vacation I'm gonna get, the pay and the benefits, they're all very important. But we have to understand that the, that the employer is giving us money. What's most important is that I want to communicate that I can deliver enough value for this position that you offer me the job. Once an employer believes that I'm the right candidate and then they offer me the position, that's the right time to start talking about money and benefits. However, I wouldn't raise the topic. I would let the employer raise it first. Do you have any other tips for candidates during the interview? Body image and body language is really, really important in an interview. I can remember interviewing someone that were slouched back and they were down and their energy was really, really low and just communicated to me, this person doesn't really want this job. They didn't feel motivated. And I can remember talking with candidates who are they're leaning forward and their, their voice is stronger. They're making a lot of eye contact directly with me. I can tell that they're really listening to what I'm saying. They're hearing what I'm saying and that they want to learn about this job to help me understand their value. So body language and eye contact are really, really important. The tone of voice is also really, really important because when we're unsure or less confident, we tend to you know, not only slouch, but our voice goes down. And that's not communicating the confidence that, you have, that you're confident in your skills and abilities. And just to finish, did you ever ask extreme questions during interviews when you worked in HR? As a director of HR, sometimes I would ask extreme questions, such as, if you could be any kind of tree in the world, what kind of tree would you want to be? Because I want to see what it reveals about someone's personality. What would a good answer be? So one good answer could be, I'd like to be an oak tree, because it's strong and it's steady. 
Another good answer could be, I'd like to be an apple tree because it's beautiful when it's blooming and it gives fruit to people that they would enjoy. Another answer could be, I'd like to be a cactus because cactuses don't need a lot of support and they're very, very persistent. They can survive. 1.26 Interview with a career counselor. Looking at language. 1. So some of the biggest mistakes that, that I've seen that people make on their resume is they include everything. 2. As an employer, I don't care what you did 20 years ago or 30 years ago. 3. You also want to do a Google search on your own name. 4. Take an eight and a half sheet of paper and make three columns. 5. You want to make sure your cell phone is turned off. 6. They're making a lot of eye contact directly with me. 1.27. On the street. Janine. When did you last have an interview for a job? Uh, the last time I had an interview for a job was in 2011. How did you prepare for the interview? Uh, I took a lot of rescue remedy to help with the nerves and I, I just practiced every question that they could ask me in my head. Did the interview go well? No, it didn't. I didn't get the job. Joe. When did you last have an interview for a job? Um, about two months ago. How did you prepare for the interview? Well, I looked at the job description and thought about my experience um, and then tried to match my experience to the various different points on the job interview. Did the interview go well? It did. How do you know it went well? Because they offered me the job. Ivan. When did you last have an interview for a job? I last had an interview for a job a few weeks ago. Um, that's the last time I had an interview for a job. How did you prepare for the interview? To prepare for the job interview, I read about the company and learned about what they did and uh, to see if I liked the work that they did. How do you know it went well? I think it went well because they followed up with an email um, to talk about uh, further opportunities at that company. Yasuko. When did you last have an interview for a job? Um, the last interview that I had was for my current company that I work for, and that was about two years ago. How did you prepare for the interview? I prepared for the interview by um, doing a little research on the company, the kind of products that they make, um, the, their philosophy, the history and their background of the company. Did the interview go well? I think that the interview went well because it was actually a long interview. I had a lot of um, good conversation with, with the, the managers there. And I also got a few more interviews afterwards and eventually got the job. So the, the interviews went well. Used. When did you last have an interview for a job? Um, about three months ago. How did you prepare for the interview? Uh, I read about the company and um, I knew what the job contents was. And um, yeah, I knew everything that I had to know for the interview and was well prepared to answer their questions. Did the interview go well? Uh, it went well. In the end, um, they said I was too young, so they didn't hire me. But um, yeah, they would have if I was older, they said. 1.28. Colloquial English Phrases 1. I just practiced every question that they could ask me in my head. 2. And then tried to match my experience to the various different points on the job interview. 3. I think it went well because they followed up with an email. 4. Their philosophy, the history and their background of the company. Five. 
in the end, um, they said I was too young, so they didn't hire me. 1.33. Shower. Sh. Pressure. Rash. Unconscious. Jazz. J. Allergy. Bandage. Chess. Ch. Choking. Temperature. Key. K. Ache. Ankle. Stomach. 1.34. Antibiotics. Symptom. Medicine. Emergency. Operation. Aspirin. Specialist. Acetaminophen. X-ray. Cholesterol. Injection. CAT scan. 1.35 Good morning, Mr. Blaine. What's the problem? I haven't been feeling well for a few days. I keep getting headaches, and I've been coughing a lot, too. And I have a temperature. Have you been taking anything for the headaches? Yes, acetaminophen. But it doesn't really help. I read on the Internet that headaches can be the first symptom of a brain tumor. How many tablets have you taken so far today? I took two this morning. And have you taken your temperature this morning? Yes, I've taken it five or six times. It's high. Let me see. Well, your temperature seems to be perfectly normal now. I think I need a blood test. I haven't had one for two months. Well, Mr. Blaine, you know, I think we should wait for a few days and see how your symptoms develop. Can you send the next patient in, please, nurse? One point thirty six. Your next patient is Mrs. Williams. Here are her notes. How many times has Mr. Blaine been to the health center this week? Uh, four times, I think. Yes, I know. He's a complete. One point forty. One, life threatening. Two, mouth ulcer. Three, alternative remedies. Four, under the weather. Five, cancer. Six, infection. Seven, Heart rate. Eight. Surgery. Nine. Pulse. Ten. Tumor. Eleven. Miracle cures. One point forty one. So, Dr. Roberta, do you meet a lot of cyberchondriacs in your work? All the time, I'm afraid. It's very common these days for people to look up their symptoms on health websites on the Internet and to diagnose themselves with weird or exotic illnesses. Hmm. For example, the other day, I had a patient who came in because his back was very red and itchy. He had been looking on Internet medical sites and was absolutely convinced that he had an extremely rare skin condition. He even knew the medical name, nodular paniculitis. Hmm. But, in fact, when I examined him and talked to him, it turned out that he had spent the weekend working in his yard in the sun and his back was sunburned. So, you would prefer your patients not to check their symptoms on the Internet? No, don't get me wrong. I'm not anti-health websites. I just want people to use them sensibly. The problem is that diagnosis of a condition or an illness doesn't just depend on one specific symptom that you can type into Google. Uh -huh. 
It depends on all kinds of other things, like a patient's appearance, their blood pressure, their heart rate, and so on. Of course. And diagnosis also depends on where you live. For example, if you live in a U.S. city and you haven't traveled overseas, it's very unlikely that you have malaria, even if you have some of the symptoms. What other problems are there when people use health websites? Well, you have to check carefully what kind of site it is that you are looking at. Some websites look as if they have been created by health professionals, but in fact, they've been set up by commercial companies that are trying to sell you something. Uh huh. Also, some healthcare sites recommend expensive treatments or medicine that is not available in all parts of the world. Are there any websites that you would recommend? Oh yes, absolutely. For example, people with chronic diseases like asthma can get a lot of help and information from online support groups. These websites have forums where you can talk to other people who have the same condition and illness, and you can usually get information about the latest research and new treatments.、Mm -hmm. And there are often online support groups for people who have unusual illnesses too. Finally. Do you have any tips for all those cyberchondriacs out there? Yes, I have three. First, only look online after you've been to the doctor. If you're not feeling well, make a list of the symptoms you have that are worrying you, and go and see your doctor with this list. Then, when your doctor has told you what he or she thinks, you could take a look online. Uh huh. Second, make sure you're looking at a reliable and professional medical website. And finally. Remember that common symptoms usually have common causes. So, if you have diarrhea, for example, it's much more likely to be food poisoning than the Ebola virus. Dr. Roberta, thank you very much. One point forty-five. Welcome to today's program in our series on age. The topic is clothes, and the question is: Do people these days dress their age, and should they? Our guests are both fashion journalists with well-known magazines. Hello, Liza and Adrian. Hello. Hi. Let's start with you, Liza. Well, the first thing I'd like to say to all the young people out there is: next time you give your grandma a warm cardigan and some slippers for her birthday, don't be surprised if she asks for the receipt, because she'll probably want to go out and exchange them for something more exciting. So you think these days women in their sixties and seventies dress much younger than they used to? Oh, absolutely. Think of women like Sophia Loren, Catherine Deneuve, Helen Mirren, and Jane Fonda. Jane Fonda is in her late seventies, and last month she was on a talk show wearing a leather mini skirt. She looked fabulous.、Oh. But of course, it isn't just famous women who are dressing younger. Some recent research says that nine out of ten women say they try to dress younger than their age. Do you think that's true? Well, it depends on your age, of course. A lot of teenage girls try to dress older than they are. Maybe to get into parties,、hmm. but I would say that from thirty onward, most women try to dress younger than they are. And do you think there's anything wrong with that? Actually, I think it's not a question of dressing older or younger. It's a question of wearing what suits you. Uh huh. And if you looked good in jeans when you were fifteen, if you keep your figure, you'll probably look good in them when you're eighty. There are a few things that can look a little ridiculous on older women, like let's see. Very short shorts, but not many. So your fashion rule would be: wear whatever you think suits you and makes you feel good. Adrian, what about men? Do you think they also try to look younger than their age? Well, interestingly, in the research Liza mentioned, only twelve percent of the men who were questioned said they had ever thought about dressing to look younger. Hmm. But actually, I think a lot of them weren't telling the truth. Look at all those middle-aged men you see wearing jeans that are too tight and incredibly bright T-shirts. You don't approve? No, I don't. Personally, I think that men should take their age into account when they're buying clothes. Do you think that some men actually dress older than their age? 
Yes, definitely. Some do. Uh huh. Some men in their 20s look as if they were 20 years older by wearing blazers and khakis, or wearing suits and ties when they don't have to. They've maybe started their careers and they want their bosses to take them more seriously. Yeah. And a lot of men in their 30s realize that they can't dress like a teenager anymore, but they go to the opposite extreme and they start buying the kind of clothes that their fathers wear. So, what would your fashion rule be for men? Dress for the age you are, not for the age you wish you were. Liza and Adrian, thank you very much. One point fifty. Boot. Ooh. Suit. Loose. Bull. O. Hooded. Wool. Tree. E. Sleeveless. Jeans. Fish. E. Linen, slippers, egg, eh, checked, leather, cat, ah, sandals, patterned, clock, ah, cotton, dotted, saw. Aw, awful, long. 1.51 A short movie on the history of surgery. Hi, I'm in Southwark, in London. This area used to be the site of one of London's oldest hospitals, St. Thomas's. St. Thomas's was here for almost 700 years and had one of the country's first ever operating theaters. Have you ever had an operation? If you have, it was probably in an operating theater like this. These modern theaters are clean, spacious, and bright. As you can see, they are full of high-tech equipment and they are designed to make surgery as clean and as safe as possible. They usually have an adjustable metal operating table in the center of the room. Above the table, there are several large fluorescent lights, which allow surgeons to see everything. At the head of the table, there's an anesthetic machine, and around the room, there are various monitors, measuring heart rate, blood pressure, and blood oxygen levels. But what about old operating theaters? What were they like? Well, that's why I've come here. You see, St. Thomas's old operating theater used to be in the attic of this church. The hospital was moved from here in the 1860s. But when a historian decided to investigate the church's old attic, he found a large abandoned room containing some old fashioned surgical equipment. Today, this room is part of the old operating theater museum. The museum has been teaching visitors about the history of surgery for over 50 years. The first question many people ask when they come here is why is it called an operating theater? Well, the answer is simple. As you can see, medical students used to stand here and watch the surgery, like an audience watching a play in a theater. During operations, the room was always cramped and crowded, and the bigger and bloodier the operation, the bigger the audience. Imagine how frightening it must have been for the poor patients. And they were usually quite poor. The rich had their operations at home, but the poor would tolerate the audience in order to receive surgery they would never be able to afford otherwise. The patient would lie on this uncomfortable wooden bench while the surgeon worked. There was no anesthetic, so patients were awake throughout the procedure. Unless, of course, they fainted. The surgeons were quick. They could amputate a leg in less than a minute. 
but they had very little understanding of hygiene. There were no antiseptics, and surgeons always wore the same coats, which were usually covered with blood from previous operations. They often used dirty instruments, which were kept on this old wooden table, and they rarely washed their hands. Below the operating table, there was a wooden box filled with sawdust or wood shavings. This collected the blood from each operation. But often, there was too much blood, so in the end, they built a false floor. The blood could be washed away and collected in the space between the new floor and the original floor. In such unhygienic conditions, it isn't surprising that patients often died during surgery. After the patient's death, their bones and organs were kept for further study. All of these practices seem primitive to us today, but without these techniques, we might never have developed the cleaner, safer procedures we have today. That's something we can all be grateful for. <laughs>